Whenever you're ready and count me down from five. Who left? Yeah. You got the pause button. Sure it's going. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another special VidMag. During the time that we've been on the air, we've done our best to bring you the most interesting information and material that we possibly can. And tonight, it's my very great pleasure to present somebody who has been around the music scene for a very long time, and this is a very special interview. I would like to introduce Mr. David Peel from David Peel on the Lower East Side. Peace. Remember those words? Peace. Give peace a chance. David, welcome to VidMag. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start out by uh, talking a little bit about your history because we have a number of fans in the audience that have not heard and of friends. you. And friends. So why don't you tell us how you got started in music and um, some of your exploits over the years. You've been around for a very long time. Well, um, so has the earth. And, uh, I must say that during this time period, of the war in, at, in the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, uh, I had to begin my, uh, my uh, segment of my lifestyle when I was in the United States Army. Yes, I was in the Army. Got an honorable discharge. But while I was in the Army, I learned about what the Army was about. I learned one thing right now that history repeats itself again and again. My history repeats itself. I have not become another person or sold myself out for any amount of money. I'll bet you ten dollars I haven't. <laughs> but, to make a long story short, I began uh, in a military in, a, in a Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska at Fort Richardson in the early 60s. From there, there was a jazz friend of mine, uh, 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 Buddy, they call him Buddies. I like the word Buddy, because it sounds like, you know, you have the Buds. Really realizing that that Buddy someday would turn me on to Buds. But he told me about Greenwich Village, Washington Square Park in New York City. I lived in Brooklyn, went to the Army, to Alaska, found out the about Greenwich Village, five minutes away from Brooklyn by way of 7,000 miles in the military. So, when I was, uh, when I got out of the army and was released, I went to Greenwich Village to find out what's happening. I was always curious about something different, a good lifestyle, partying, having a good time. When I came to the village around 1965, as I climbed out the subway steps, as soon as I saw the first sight of the, the West Village, it was love at first sight. It was like, you know, thunder. Going, it was like the great thunder review inside my head and mind and body. It was a rush. That would begin my new life, my alternate life, being a rock and roll outlaw. We got into the hippie movement. In the hippie movement, the flower people, a la, I did not know what marijuana was, first of all. The only thing I smoked was cigarettes. But, we first started a being, going and watching the square park, playing music, before the being, having a good time every Sunday, enjoying ourselves with the folk musicians, where Bob Dylan began. I did not play with these people, they, they were from the same environment. Peter, Paul, and Mary, Richie Havens. People like this, the, um, um, uh, John Sebastian from The Loving Spoonful. This enrichment is oasis of talent and lifestyles and politics and activism. With the army on my right, and the, the, uh, the village on my left, I now became a bona fide hippie. 
Yes, I was a hippie. What's a hippie? A hippie is someone who hangs around flower power people during the 60s, turning on, tuning in, dropping out. Right, Timothy Leary? Before you were, before and after you were Timothy Leary? LSD? Now, also, I decided to get into the music field because of the great influences. I wanted to know what I could do for my life. I worked in banks. I worked on Wall Street. I was a businessman. I loved the market because it had energy. And I loved challenges. We had no movement there, but we did have energy. So, as time went on, and the powers of the uh, counterculture became bigger and bigger with the Beatles, the British Invasion, Bob Dylan, uh, the Fugs. The Fugs were a very great influence on me. The Fugs were an underground counterculture rock band where Ed Sanders, uh, with Tulip Kuffenberg, with uh, Ken Weaver, etc. When I heard their music, they gave me the seeds to begin the underground direction of my music. I had a choice of going either way, but they show me a reality of going underground, which means you can start to support a better way of life for people like yourself throughout the world. So, I started playing the music, and the first thing we did to, uh, to activate ourselves was start a cultural movement for smoking. Not marijuana, but bananas. In 1966 and 67, we had a smoking of banana skins movement. So strong was that, they call me Banana Dave then, so strong was that, that at the first official being, <coughs> excuse me, in Central Park, New York, more people were smoking banana skins than marijuana in the first being. How do I know? Because we were one of the major singers, singing groups, the banana trippers, in Central Park at the first being. Again, in the first being in New York City, Central Park, more people smoke banana skin than marijuana. Now, what happened? I realized since I smoked nothing, anything was better than nothing to get high and enjoy myself in this movement. But as time and reality start sitting, uh, setting in for my fantasies, we realized banana skins were not the way to get high. I even went to the United Food Company to help them sponsor us. I went right to the Peters. They thought it was crazy. Oh, you want to sponsor banana skin? Sure, go to Canada and I'll help you out there. We were frying them. And here's a song, the first song I wrote when I was working in Wall Street. We were counting all the stocks and bonds, or I was actually like security as a watcher to make sure that the accounting companies didn't rip off the stocks and bonds. I wrote a song, I'll do a little part of it, called Banana Grass. When I wrote the song, the first time I sang it in Washington Square Park, I saw everybody at one time give me peel mania. Look at me like this, boom. Instantly gravitate towards me, and I knew it was a David Peel for tomorrow. Here's how it goes in a short way. Banana grass. Wait for 300 degrees in heaven After you fry the banana skin Smoke it, smoke it You have a friend called Banana Grass Freak out, freak out Banana Grass Get high, get high Banana Grass High, high, high 
How? They even try to bust me for banana skins. The police would bring this vinyl of banana skin grass. They try to bust me because it looked like marijuana. Then I realized it was good for the moment for a fun thing. But I was desperate to find what really was getting me to turn on to. Enters marijuana. I go and I have been in the park in Washington Square in the village for eight months and never smoked a joint. Then it all happened at one time. A friend of mine brought me to the West Village. I mean, excuse me, I, w I lived in the West Village. He brought me this uh, new, uh, new uh, uh, plant and he gave me my first joint of marijuana. I smoked it. As a matter of fact, the song Light My Fire. What a coincidence. Light My Fire by the Doors is playing. It's got to be 1967, I think. I smoked it, and it blew my mind. It, I, it reminds me of when I had my first cigarette in, uh, in the 50s. And it blew my mind. It was a, the greatest rush in the world. Something real for Peel. And from that point on, I decided to change my way of life from bananas to marijuana. So I decided to write another song. The first song I ever wrote in my life was Banana Grass. But the greatest song I ever wrote was I Like Marijuana. So in the park, Washington Square Park, people started getting turned on to this. Now it was real. Everything started happening. No more fantasy of, of fakeness or uh, uh, untripping, on high. We, we began doing this to such a point where we started getting more and more crowds, People getting them more and more together. We got rid of the out crowd. The in crowd now became the out crowd. Anybody who was in the park became the in crowd. Electric records saw me turning on with people of how we get high with the music and the subject. After that, they signed me to a contract with Electric Records, the home of the doors. And I got on the Electric Records because Jim Morrison and the doors were on there. Remember, the first time I ever got high, the first song I was doing it with was Light My Fire. And we couldn't find a title for the album. But Abby Hoffman had a big demonstration in Grand Central Station in 1968. And I was singing I like marijuana, you like marijuana, we like marijuana too. Marijuana, 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 marijuana. I like marijuana, you like marijuana, we like marijuana too. And on and on and on. Somebody from Time Magazine, a reporter, Heard me sing this while the demonstration going on. We took over Grand Central Station for over 10 hours. We controlled that with the demonstrators. Real people. With Abby Hoffman. And the detective says, Hey, why don't you keep on playing music till you stop making people, uh, so people won't be so, so, so people will stop being so, uh, um, uh, uh, giving so many, so much hassle to do, to the, uh, to the, uh, 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 to the police. Little did he realize, if anything, it only improved the demonstration. They picked the wrong guy. But Time Magazine overheard my music, and in the next issue, sometime in May, 1968, they wrote this uh, piece, I'll just paraphrase, then there's this young hippie singing, singing, have a marijuana song. I showed this, I, I read this uh, Time magazine, and I showed the people from Electric Records a story. And the promoter, the, uh, the promoter there and the AR man decided to use the word have a marijuana for my album. So I got to thank, thank very much Time magazine for making my have a marijuana uh, title, song title possible. Without their mistake, it was not half a marijuana, it was I like marijuana. <coughs> but since I mumble my New York accent, no, I have a marijuana, they thought I said half a marijuana. So with a, uh, the negative power of positive thinking, 
we put that into context as the album. To this day, the word marijuana has never been used as a song of the title of a record cover or a movie. The word marijuana. I don't mean pot, hemp, with the word marijuana. It's such a strong word, and I must thank Time Magazine again and again. You fools didn't know who you were dealing with. And David Peel learned to deal with time. Thank you. Now, on the, uh, as I moved along, the record uh, became one of the greatest cultural records in the world. I'm going to go way up to 19. I'm going to jump real back. Uh, I'm going to back, I mean, jump right into the future. I did another record called Legalized Mar I mean, uh, American Revolution with Electra again, playing George Washington. And I found out through friends of mine who do, uh, uh, who do uh, freelance for high times in Czechoslovakia. The president of Czechoslovakia, Havel, President Havel, what's his first name? Václav. Huh? Václav. Václav. Václav Havel was at a wedding party in September 1990, just last year. And the guests, first of all, Havel is a very, very good fan of John Lennon. And all the guests were singing one of my songs called Everybody Smoking Marijuana. This is the honest truth, I have proof by the reporter who eyewitnessed this whole situation. He was in Europe, Eastern Europe for about, uh, for the summertime, and uh, some of the fall, and he happened to be in Czechoslovakia for a while. And there's President Havel singing together with the guests, everybody smoking marijuana. So he imitated him for me, he's going to Everybody smoking marijuana. Everybody smoking marijuana. Everybody smoking marijuana. Everybody smoking marijuana. Of course, he just everybody smoking marijuana. That chief of state singing, everybody smoking marijuana. This is not an opinion; it's a fact. President Havel saying my song. I feel so honored and flattered that I am going to send him my next record to be released called Legalize Marijuana. If you want to get the legalization of hemp or marijuana done, let's start from the top and work our way from the bottom. Uh, the weed is very deep. Now, Going back to uh, another part, now going back to 1969, to 1970, we had all these smokings, we did all these things for the war against, v uh, uh, against the war in Vietnam. The reason why, oh, not against the soldiers, they, they're doing a job because they're told to do a job. But I was against the fact that this war had no purpose. I look to date, the proof is right now. What did we lose? What did we lose by losing the war in Vietnam? Did we lose property? Did we lose uh, 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 Vietnam going all over the world, uh, destroying different countries to become a complete uh, power, power state? It was an ideology of capitalism at its worst, trying to use that war for an excuse for patriotism. That communist bullshit had no meaning whatsoever. These guys are too poor to be that type of communist. They need to get themselves together. And to this day, they are very, very strung out. Their, their country is a complete, total disaster. Because there was no purpose for war. There should never be any wars. So, we did that and the results, as you know, didn't work out for America because when we have no purpose, we don't ever, ever support a no purpose situation. An action that has no purpose has no purpose to be an action. And the people will not stand food throughout the world, including myself. Now going to move on, in 1971, I met John Lennon. 
John Lennon, the Beatle. You see these glasses I'm wearing right now? I was influenced by John Lennon. I also had other people influence me because this was basically the style at that time. But John Lennon influenced me a lot with the glasses. After he left the Beatles. And uh, some biker pictures I saw turned me on to him too. But most important, it was that nice sign, that nice design of the, the full circle. So, what happened was in in 1971, in the early spring or middle spring, I was uh, I was home. A friend of mine from my band, the Lower East Side, told me that John Lennon was hanging out in New York City. He went to St. Mark's place, looking to buy some clothes at a place called Limbo. Limbo is here, and um, he was with Yoko Ono and a friend of mine called Howard Smith, who was a good reporter for the Village Voice. So when I first met John Lennon, I introduced myself. I put my hand out and said, yo, John. I'd say, yo, we didn't have, the word yo was not there. Hi, John. The word hi is now replaced by yo. Yo, what's happening? No, hi, what's happening? You see the difference in the movements now. And uh, when I introduced myself to him, he wasn't impressed. I said, hi, I'm David Peel, and I got, I'm from Electric Record. I did a record, record. Okay. He gave me that, uh, that, he gave you that cold fish shake, you know, whatever it may be. Um, or shave fish. Shave fish. A shave fish <laughs> a shake. No? And that was the end of that, until Howard Spit turned around and noticed I was there a little while later. He in reintroduced me to John and Yoko. And all of a sudden, a second lightning bolt came down into my life. I had a sponsor, and that sponsor was a friend. And the friend of my friend was John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Now, he was a little embarrassed again, but now he has to be reintroduced, this time formally by somebody who he believed in, which was Howard Smith who, by the way, won an Academy Award for Marjo. Because Oscar, he did, he's not impressed. But uh, the most important thing was, it gave me a, a proof of, it's not what you know only, it's who you know. That still stands to this day. And he, he told John and Yoko that David Peel, after being introduced, that David Peel plays in Washington Square Park every Sunday. Weekends. Would you like to see David Peel playing his underground music in Washington Square? And well, John is curious, and Yoko, they, they're basically sightseeing what's happening down here. And they said, okay, we'll do it. So Howard said, we'll see you Sunday. Little did I ever think that would ever happen. You know, everyone gives like jive and bull. Yeah, you'll be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I went to my uh, formality, informalities of playing music for the people, are free, of course, in Washington Square. And about 2 or 3 o'clock, enters John and Yoko and Howard Smith. You couldn't believe what happened from that point on. One of my friends told me they were there. I spotted them in the back of the audience. The Beatle, John Lennon, Yoko, the art the art, uh, avant-garde art genius, together watching David Peel. I felt so honored and so basic that I started going through all my songs categories. I sing I Like Marijuana, I sing this and that, Happy Mother's Day, the Runaway song, but then I sing a song called The Pope Smokes Dope. And all of a sudden I saw both of them light up. Oh my God. They didn't light up a joint, they just light, lit up inside their minds. That would come later. And from that point on, I became another mental morphosis. It became part of a mental morphosis, which became a metamorphosis, which now became David Peel Part 2. O-O-T-O-O. -O -O. 
And Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman were great friends of yours uh, that entered Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, who are now with John and Yoko. I meet them at other time. They happen to be they happen to like what I did because I did a lot of radical music and radical demonstrations as a musician for Abby and Jerry and for everyone else. So they knew about me too. So they helped endorse me. I then got contracted. We went to uh, we, we we went to uh, uh, the East Village, and I started having a live performance with John and Yoko. And I sang the song "The Post Smoke Stove." Little did I realize that was my first audition. My second audition, by the way. I had one on the West Side, in Washington Square Park. I had one East Side on Second Avenue, right near my house, about two blocks away. That's we West. East, we became one. The cops, again, just like every other time, try to get us to stop singing, move on, move on. They try to get their picture in the paper or try to show their, that they're, they're, they're the law, we're the authority, and we can tell the Beatles and Peel and everyone else to move on. There's no need for that, but they did anyway. A pig is always a pig, is a pig, when they're wrong. So, from that point on, I wrote a song called the Ballad of New York City, John Lennon, Yoko Ono. Nobody ever wrote about John Lennon or Yoko Ono ever except John and Yoko for themselves. So I wrote a song about them. What could be greater honor than to give people a song in their honor? Jerry Rubin told them about them, gave them a tape that I made, and they were very, 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 uh, they were very, very surprised that I did this. So to make a long story short, I told him, uh, Jerry says, why don't you come over and play for John and Yoko? So there I am on that big bed, uh, bed uh, right near the bed, sitting on a chair, near, uh, on Bank Street in the West Village. And by God, I'm being auditioned, based indirectly, not really auditioned, but performing. I'm performing for John Lennon and Yoko. What did I do to get all of this? Was it, uh, uh, was it, uh, uh, the gods from heaven? God is great? Or was it just Peel just being himself? I got a, a strange feeling it was just David Peel being David Peel. They were so turned on about me playing a song about them, which goes like this. I'll give you a short part of it. Now I see why people sing hymns to God. The greatest gift you could ever give somebody is a song. And I gave him that greatest gift. Now, later on, we go to the John Sinclair Benefit in the Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
And I'm now part of the Plastic Ono Band, the Lower East Side. But we're singing to help John Sinclair to be free. And he was free. And, and next weekend, and the, after the weekend in December, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, then I went on a David Force show, TV show, in January 1972. And lo and behold, John Lennon became the Lower East Side Band. And this time, he played washtub bass, and Yoko played drums. I played guitar, Jerry Room played a little drum, and I had other multiple musicians who played violins. We had a big band. They said, you only allow four people on stage. We can't pay everybody else. So I got four people on my band. Now I said, Can I, is it okay if I put John Lennon on too? He wants to play. Of course. Is it okay if I put Yoko Ono on? She wants to play. Of course, what could David Force do? <laughs> then I said, how about Jerry Rubin? He wants to play. And before you know it, we had 14 people on stage. Everybody got paid, including John and Yoko, for playing the Lower East Side uh, band. And the songs we sang were, the post, I mean, uh, no, 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 we sang um, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, and also we sang a song called the hippie from New York City. And the energy was of the 15 up level, way, way up in the clouds. And the song goes like this for hippie from New York City. Part of it. And remember, he's playing Watch Up. See, John Lennon played Skiffle Boy or Watch Up before he was a Beatle, when they were the quarrymen, when they first started. I'm proud to be a New York City hippie I'm proud of dirty feet and dirty hair I'm proud of living with the cockroaches I'm proud of living in a garbage can I'm proud to be a New York City hippie I'm proud of dirty feet and dirty hair I'm proud of living with the cockroaches we hate to go to work, we live on welfare We like to have ourselves another ball We hate your barn, your dances and your moonshine We like to have you up against the wall We want to warn your squares and all you rednecks If you hate the hippies from New York we we'll unify the hippies from the country We'll fight until the south becomes the north I'm proud to be a New York City hippie I'm proud of dirty feet and dirty hair I'm proud of living with the cockroaches I'm proud of living in a garbage can I'm proud to be a New York City hippie I'm proud of dirty feet and dirty hair I'm proud of living with the cockroaches I'm proud of living in the garbage can I'm proud of living in the garbage can Where the hippies, the hippies from New York Fire! Hippies from New York City And John's going like this and we're giving the power hand and everybody got turned on to a trip I'll never forget. And this is what's the beginning of my other life. Or add on to my, uh, my life from before. Now, there were things in common he liked about me, me being my spirit of the streets. There were things I liked about him, his spirit on stage and on records. And with this, he did an album for me. He signed me to Apple Records. And we did an album called The Pope Smokes Dope. Now, it's very funny about The Pope Smokes Dope. I really had no Pope really in mind what to do. I just like the way it sounds, The Pope Smokes Dope, you know. Just as much as you have the New Jersey Devils on that Satan followed because it happened to be a hockey team. Or the Pittsburgh Pirates on that Buccaneers. But The Pope Smokes Dope sounds very, very enticing for a title. So I used that title. But little did I realize, many, many years later, back into the future, 
that there would be a Pope of Pot. Pope Michael I, Mickey, Caesar, was a Pope that I was looking for in my prophecy. And this guy is really into it. He goes to jail for marijuana. He believes in the cause. So, was it the Pope smokes dope? John speaking over, we had some words on the record about him saying this. And at that time, after we did the album, they had an introduce, uh, they had a, uh, uh, an interview with John Lennon, how he met David Peel, and he gave his whole scenario of how he met me, how he liked what I did. And one of the greatest things he said was, it took 40 years for Picasso to be as simple as David Peel. David Peel's a natural. You can write pop songs as easy as, as pie if you wanted to. Why don't I do it? Because I want to be me. I will do commercial music if I had to do it, or if I wanted to do it. And maybe I will do it, because I shouldn't do it, I'll do it. To make a long story short, we now have ourselves going back into the past, present, and future of David Peel and John Lennon. Now, Bob Dylan, I want to talk about Bob Dylan. And this Bob Dylan, who had a lot of problems with A.J. Wibberman, who I helped with the garbageology. We were in and out of his trash cans as you are what you throw away. And we did a good job. And I wrote a song called The Ballad of Bob Dylan. He said he called me up. And he wanted to know why I was writing a song about him. I told him why. So he made a, uh, we had a meeting at my apartment in the East Village. And Bob Dylan, I mean, what is it? All the lightning striking me forever. Comes into my house. I felt like a, uh, a uh, pothead of state. And here we go. Bob Dylan coming to my house to be counseled by David Field. Whatever that means. So uh, I said, I'm ranging here. I go now. Now I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm on, I'm on a uh, joint roll now, man. Really going on, right? Well, I'm on a rock and roll or street roll. And I invite Bob Dylan to see my show as a fat black pussycat in the Greenwich Village area of McDougal Street. And Bob Dylan came the, uh, the Saturday. We invited him Friday, but he came Saturday to see my show. He stayed there for 40 minutes watching me perform my crazy nonsense and satire and street songs. He enjoyed every bit of it. I could see him smoking, he had his hands like this. He just smiled, getting off for the whole trip, man. He really enjoyed what we were doing. You wouldn't believe the second billing to me that night was Henry Paul from the out group called The Outlaws, who I had the honor of having them back me up for rehearsals to play a, uh, uh, a performance in Daytona, Florida, Daytona Beach, with also Country Joe, uh, Country Joe, not Country Joe Fish. We never got to that point of actually performing live, but we did rehearse together in their uh, uh, homes in Florida. Henry Paul came many years later and told me that their group Outlaws went gold. He went with gold. But then he broke down. He said, but Bob Dylan came to see you. He saw you play your music. He was into you with doing man. And I felt very, very good being there on the same stage with you as Bob Dylan was there watching. The guy went down to the most humble part of his own self. I felt very, very gratifying that I could have that great privilege of having both of these people in the same place doing their own thing. Bob Dylan being Bob Dylan, enjoying David Peel, Henry Paul before he was the Outlaws, playing his music, and David Peel, of course, being himself. Now we move on. And by the way, uh, we move on to a later time. And this punk rock. Show them a picture over here of the people from the Sex Pistols. Sid Vicious is there, 
what you see in the camera, but because of uh, Malcolm McLaren, he, he looked a little bit like him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, he, he, he designed his band of four different people to put them together in England to become the Sex Pistols. And with that ideology and concept, enters punk rock. Although the Ramones began in New York area, about the, basically about the same time, it was the Sex Pistols that turned me on to this new sound. Because it sounded like what I did before. I was seeing something from the past, being updated to the future or the present. And we have a song which is very radical at the time by the Sex Pistols. I am an anarchist. I am a anarchist. like that, not quite that same. It doesn't make a difference anyway. But he sang a song to God save the queen. You know who I mean. God save the queen. Whatever. Obviously, however I say it, it still sounds the same anyway. But that gave me a rush. A simple song like this. I like what they were saying. And how to sing it. I saw another movement beginning to fall into the lap of the world. Back to basics. Back to basics. It seems like I keep on talking over and over again of the basic life itself. If you realize, I thought this would be, and it could have been, the greatest move on a positive sense, as much as Bob Dylan for civil rights, the sex persons could have done in human rights as far as the movement be reawakening again. Bringing, giving, uh, giving a shot, no pun in the arm of the movement. But what I did not like about what they were doing was the dope, the hard drugs, the cutting of their bodies with razor blades, putting pins through their ears and faces. I now began to see the rise and fall of rock and roll. Not only was it the Sex Pistols that were doing their thing, they were great innovators. They hustled, they used the system for the system for themselves. They made a full of mockery of the system, making them all give them money from Warner Bros. right on to get everything they could get without ever making a move. To make a long story short, but it was not meant for them to be. They had a big tour in America from Memphis to California broke up by the time they came back, and enters Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious moves to the Chelsea Hotel, and with his girlfriend, the girl is murdered, and then he kills himself. Beautiful people, beautiful English uh, music lads, great potential, self-affliction, death wish. I never agree with that. I never will agree with that. Then we had a fascist contingency of this. We had a very aggravated people who were not the hair that helped the movement. They were out to hurt themselves. There were some good parts of punk rock. I will not say that's wrong. We're not all good, but the most important elements of punk rock were self-destructive. David Peel will never join the living dead. Got it? So I began my own response to that. For every action is a reaction. I began my new record called King of Punk. Because in the King of Punk, I began all that stuff. Ramones, the Ramones manager was my first manager, excuse me, A&R person. From Electric Records, he got him into uh, Sire Records. And I see people indirectly like, doing what I've been doing all the while. Naturally, but they did it in another way. So I did the King of Punk to put down King of Punk, uh, put down Punk, and the song went like this. I'm 
suicide. I'm the king of punk from the Lower East Homicide. I'm the king of punk from the streets of the Lower East Side. Where were you in 1968? Yellow jagger, dirty faggot, master, masturbate. Ramones go home, you're all full of crap. Now you know why you're handicapped. Sex pistol, self-destructed and stoned. You don't have a place in a rock and roll hall. Get drunk, shoot, jump, shoot yourself, and kill yourself. Suicide. I'm the king of punk from the streets of the Lower East Side. King of punk from the streets of the Lower East Suicide. I'm the king of punk from the streets of the Lower East Homicide. I'm the king of punk from the streets of the Lower East Side. Punk rock. And that became my, my anthem cry to the people who like to bring people down with them to kill each other off. That is not me. I don't join the living dead. Now we go on, move on like this. And then, just when I thought uh, the punk rock thing was over, a lot of that Nazi hardcore, not all hardcore is bad, but there's a, there's a Nazi part, which I don't like, the fascist regime of this. Again, people pick it on the weak because they think they have strength through their misconcepts of rock and roll. And whatever they do, we do much more down in the streets, much stronger, directly to the point. We're always playing for and with people. Even here in uh, Ohio, the Low East Side Band is a group of people from Ohio. My band is like my Sedona band. We, whatever band is there, we use. Sometimes I bring my own band from New York. Most of the times I don't. So as time goes on and that starts to fade out and goes into its own little world, its own little nest of blood and degeneracy, which we, we do degeneracy too, but not in that way. We give life, not death. Enters yuppie scum. The yuppie scum, the yuppie people. The me generation, me money. What happened to transpire this whole thing is a man who I thought was one of the greatest people in the activist movement in the 60s and early 70s, Jerry Rubin. The yippie founder with others turns into a yuppie. Jerry Rubin works on Wall Street. He tells everybody to touch himself, get in tune with yourself. It felt like he was filling himself up or something. I mean, God, if you're, you're going to make love, don't you have to, you have to start with yourself, start with others. But do it naturally. But it was that love for self, it was love for greed. To make money and more money on the backs of other people, to destroy a culture of the highest proportions to this day has not rebound itself to a normal way of life. The normal way of life right now, this is N-O-R-M-A-L, normal as the word uh, in the dictionary, the common noun, made the poor Worse, it threw people out of their homes. It made education go to an all-time low in America. It made people richer and richer and less and very apathetic towards each other. It became from the we generation to the me generation. What can I get? In the, in the middle 80s, they made a, a survey and found out, do survey, that the college students who graduated, who had graduated school, 75% of the people who graduate said they probably would work, uh, get a degree in business. They wanted to get in finance or business administration, whatever it may be. They wanted to get into business. So the big invasion started in New York City, in, uh, in the Yuppie Gate of Wall Street, etc. Here comes at the David Perry. I can't stand this. So a good friend of mine, who's also one of my co uh, conspirators and partners, in helping to make things better by fighting the problems with solutions through music, Greg Rex. 
he together with me, a young person of a new generation who has the energy, like myself, to climb into action. We write a song called The Yuppie Ghetto. It was against the pigs and the scum and the condominiums in New York, from the dumb Trumps to the Jerry Rubens and to the rest of the uh, yuppie, uh, uh, yuppie faction pigs, young urban pigs of the world, <laughs> including from Japan to Germany to America to the rest of the world. Our yuppie pig is still yuppie scum throughout the world. City. Pigs! We've been fighting them ever since. And every time, time we see them, we go after them with our own music. Going back to the past, I also met Jim Morrison because I was on Lecture Records. From Light My Fire to Getting Stone to meeting one of my greatest heroes. These people like Jim Morrison, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, whoever it may be, Richie Havens, people are very special because their great messages through, through their personalities are able to deliver what a doctor does for your body, they do for your heart and soul. They have a way of delivering, uh, delivering the message to you to get turned on to and make you feel better or aware of. Jim, Jim Morrison told one of his friends about me and a quote was, his quote was, David Peel is the only friend I've ever known whose subconscious craziness is on par with mine. Now, the Doors movie will be out from Oliver Stone. I like that name. Ohio, Oliver Stone. Duh. <laughs> now, it's going to come out with Oliver Stone. It'll be out very shortly. I'm planning to see it. I have autographed pictures of all these people because I like to keep history in perspective. I don't want this, this future of, uh, of no creative music. Now, there's a lot of creative music, but most, a lot of it's a lot of crap. I want to make sure we, we remember what great music we had and never to lose. We don't want to lose our history like the Africans have lost theirs. Or they tried to do to the American Indians or to the Greeks. 
and to ourselves. Okay. Now, this means we have now gone from the yuppie scum to clean out the ghetto, and we got into the environment. I was always at the environment, always been an environment act, uh, activist. Now, these people, I mean, these people really felt, including myself and others, these people called the Earth people who really want to see a better way of life for planet Earth and its people. I keep on saying the word people because the word peels are the word people. And, uh, I was at the first Earth Day in New York City, which began the whole movement for Earth Peace, Earth Day. I was there, my picture was in, I think, Newsweek magazine with this. Or Life, one of those uh, pictures, one of those magazines. And today I have because, uh, a new record called Save the Earth. Again, with my friend Greg Rex, these, this guy, these kids and friends of mine are really helping me out. And with Save the Earth, this also means save the hemp, because that's part of the earth. It's a natural weed. We want everything naturally in this world to become and stay that way. Let's not rape the world of its own natural resources. The pollution is killing us. When I was in Alaska in the 60s, it was purely perfect. Great air. Now they have big oil spills. X scum has to use a poor scapegoat captain to put on his shoulders. Where did this guy get such power for the biggest uh, company in the United States of America? Where did, it, where did he get such power being a meagle captain, captain getting drunk? God forbid we ever have this kind of, kind of power for ourselves. We all have to be self destructive. And so I wrote with Greg Rex. Was called Save the Earth. Give credit where credit to. I do. I don't try to hype people unless it's fact. I'm not here to give people a plug, just for the sake of being a plug. I'm giving you people to know what's happening. That not only I, David Peel, do things as is. I also have people help me. I always like sharing the work of music. That's. This is a song that we hope, and I'm being very, it's not finished yet, as far as the music. It's going to be based on a lot of the music of Pink Floyd. I call it Peel Floyd, but it's David Peel and the people. I like your guitar here.
It's our world we must not end. Save, save, save the earth. Save, save, save the earth. Save, save, save the earth. It's our world, we can't pretend. Save the earth, my friend. It's our world, we must not end. Save the earth. And I finally now, we're finally up to this point now. It's the environment we're going to be doing that record that will be coming out very shortly. The records are also here to help us to, to our Music Peace Foundation to help the causes to give us a better way of life. Not as a pig, but not as greedy, but as never being needy. And we go to now. The Desert War, the Gulf War at the Persian Gulf. Middle East. And with this now, we go back to a complete full circle. But this circle is dangerous. Because what comes around goes around, around till it's not around anymore. And right here, I have a poem called War Longitudes because of the Middle East. We better get our act together or we will not be together to do our act. This is cool. I'll just do one of these right now because it really makes a point. Call war longitudes. I feel like I'm doing story tales like, you know, like uh, Teddy Roosevelt or uh, The brother's grim, because it's a pretty grim brother, sisters. What Longitudes, part one. When the life dies forever in battle and kills promise for war to peace, countries breed hatred from love. No logic is reason. Soldiers of God and the first patriot is Lucifer. Pain viciously screaming the beast in human beings. And death attacks truth, emotions, lies, logic, insanity. In good evil spirits, protecting the body as sin greeds the soul to never the end to begin. War Longitudes, part two. You gotta find the truth. When the war clouds inspire to battle and its evil and wickedness weathers the storm for destruction, true living is dead. Logic insanes. And the last human race is genocide. Arms viciously fighting to assist life to death. And war breeds hate pain, sin, damnation, lust, power, murder. In peace, doomsday's tragedy, carefully planning the end of the world. So the song I just finished writing as my final piece is the last song. It's called Peace in the Middle East. And that will be my conclusion to this realm of thought of David Peel. Peace in the middle.
Middle East and the planet Earth. Peace in the Middle East and the planet Earth. Peace in the Middle East and the planet Earth. Everybody's one. Countries in the Middle East, part of the global nation. The right to live in the Middle East must give freedom, harmony. Today and tomorrow of a brave new world. For the people in their own countries. Peace in the Middle East. And the planet Earth Peace in the Middle East And the planet Earth Peace in the Middle East Cannot be made by war We must work together To make peace forevermore Peace in the Middle East And the planet Earth Peace on earth forever Peace in the Middle East and the planet Earth Peace in the Middle East, peace on earth forever All we are saying Is give peace a chance All we are saying Thank you very much. David Peel in the Lower East Side from New York City. Hi, goodbye. Oh, hi. Oh. Great, 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 great place to be. If you want to be in Ohio. Remember, legalize hemp, decriminalize marijuana, and support your local normal chapter. Get the job done in America. Peace. Thank you very much, David Peel. Whew. What more can we say? Sir, it's been a very great pleasure and an honor. What, what, you got a history right there. Absolutely. Maybe give, give, give me, make, make a few of these copies. Right? Absolutely. What, one one, further, one the... thing further, one thing further. Is there an address that anybody can write to if they want to find out more information on how they can help some of these can you, put it, can you put it in the... Uh, yes, you, you can say it for me, okay? Um, put down post office, uh, post office box. I think you have, you have the card? Mm -hmm. Just you know, take it from the card. Take it from the card for further detail. And it says, honest communication, whatever. It's like this. David Peel, the same exact way. Don't put the telephone number though. Right. Yes. My God, I'm getting very emotional, but I'm going to be very careful about it. See what happens? You, you have to. I mean, it's an no, emotional it's really, it's really, it's really, It really is, because we only began the first part. And um, it's really, you, uh, what, what I really begin to see, as you get more and more experience, you begin to see almost like a helplessness of doing nothing wrong gives the person the right to do wrong to someone who's right. I guess I don't give a shit. And if you don't fight back, you don't give a shit either. But like Sir Isaac Newton says, for every action, there's got to be reaction. There's an old Russian saying, by the way, when a hunter puts down the gun, he soon becomes a prey. When the person stops doing action, he becomes the victim. Let's go into action right now. Fight for the right to be free. Or fight for the right to be right. And uh, as we go along, at the end of our, as we do our tour, and this is one of our things, I'm thinking about what you said before. I feel very satisfied. My, my, I had a great career. A lot of my friends passed away. A lot of people are still around. 
But the people who really have purpose for life, life gives them a purpose to live. And that's what we're all about. I see people die rich and poor. I see people end up doing nothing with their life because they have nothing to do. But right now, there is a chance to get back, and it begins with the first step of saying, I will help out. And do it. Don't talk. Do it. You know, I have a philosophy, by the way, too. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do, I mean, if you're gonna do something, excuse me, I have a philosophy that says, if you're gonna say something, if you're gonna say you're gonna do it, do it. If you're not gonna do it, don't say it. One more time. If you're gonna say something to do that you're gonna do, do it. If you're not gonna do something, if you're not going to do something, don't say it. And that's my final piece of a, of a philosophy for all you people who are part of my people, who I am you as a people. Peace in the Middle East. And the planet Earth. David Peel. And the Lower East Side.